Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of JavaScript Jabber. This week on our panel, we have Steve Edwards. Hello from a all of a sudden cool and misty Portland today. Dan Shapir. Hi, coming from a warm and sunny Tel Aviv, as is usual in August in Tel Aviv. AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you from an early fall. I'm Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs, and uh, I'm going to introduce our guest, but just seeing his face just reminds me of interviewing him back in like 2009 or something. <laughs> We've got Tom Preston Warner. Uh, Tom, do you want to introduce yourself, let people know who you are and why we like you? Sure, yeah. Tom Preston Warner. I live just north of San Francisco in Marin County, and you probably know me best as the co-founder of GitHub, but I've also created a lot of open source projects that you may have heard of or used, like Jekyll or Semantic Versioning or Toml, the configuration language, um, various other things, but but those are, the, those are the big ones. So I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So yep, could you explain absolutely. what GitHub is for those who might not know? All right, so GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I it's hear funny this. because I, I, what is the explanation of GitHub? What is that? It's it's so, a social coding platform where people can collaborate on code. Okay. I I still remember you and Chris talking about it at like a Rails conf or something. It was just a little little project that you were trying to get people to use. I know. Well, everything starts. Small, <laughs> it turned right? into this like thing. Everything... Everything yeah. big started out as something small. And now you're yeah. an authentication platform. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, there yeah, we go. that's true, right? That's a true measure of success. Do people use you to log into other things? Ah, uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> that's, how, that's how you know you've <laughs> arrived. Yeah. So you're, you're doing the Redwood JS thing, and I think we've had you on before to talk about it. But we probably could do with just a brief reminder of like what it is and how it works. And then we can get into, okay, well, what's coming? Because you're doing some pretty interesting stuff there. Yeah, Redwood JS is a, a full stack TypeScript, JavaScript web application framework where we really try to integrate a lot of really great open source tools and add sort of our special sauce on top of it and make it a really beautiful experience for building full stack web application uh, things like a, like any kind of SaaS app. Or, you know, you could build a GitHub type of thing with, Redwood, mm -hmm. and we've done a lot of the work for you around integrating things like testing, storybook, um, an ORM. So it, you know, I come from a Rails development background, and I love that. But there's no Rails for JavaScript, and that's right. partly why Redwood exists is to sort of fill that gap and say, why are we all integrating and building our own frameworks? That's a lot of duplicated effort, and it's hard to transfer then these skill sets from job A to job B. And I thought it was time to combine some of these things along with some other technical things I was trying to accomplish with Redwood. And that's kind of where it comes from. So I've been thinking about this over the years and to, to the very premise. So we have WordPress. We didn't rewrite WordPress in Ruby or we didn't create a, a WordPress in Rails because WordPress is the PHP killer app it is the singular reason for PHP. Rails. <laughs> you just heard Facebook. a whole bunch of people's feelings. <laughs> that that <laughs> is Facebook, I think. But Facebook's not written PHP. And then, I mean, it used to be once upon a time, but like, anyway, I mean, that's in Twitter's what about not written PHP in Rails anymore. BB, that was my favorite. Uh, great, okay, great it, sure, but that yeah, and and then and PHP BB is still out there. So then we had Rails, and Rails was Ruby's killer app and it was like yes more really. control than wordpress but still pretty cookie cutter and when node came out it seems like the thing that both you know that the time period as well as the technology what node was well suited for especially because javascript was admittedly much worse back then uh there was so so many more things weren't yet standardized and people were still bickering and fighting over you know, which of the 10 different ways you could organize parameters and promises was going to be the one that wins out, right? Mm -hmm. but, but the thing about Node was it was for connecting APIs. And I don't feel like Node has had a killer app other than Express, which is kind of like, it's a better Sinatra because it's way more, way more performant. So... 
with and and I've seen there's like sales and and there's a couple of others that people have tried to replicate Rails and Node. But my question is, if you want Rails, why not use Rails? Why is something else going to be successful where Node seems to take have taken over a different market and that's not its killer app? Yeah, well, I don't know that. I mean, there have I think been attempts to to really recreate Rails in a more specific way where it's like where it feels like rails you're using a lot of the same patterns so just to be clear redwood js is not that it's sort of inspired by some of the feelings of using rails but it's not trying to be rails as such it's trying to be all of the tooling all of the really great tooling that we have in the javascript typescript world these days but combined in a way that makes them all really shine together in a in a way that Rails gave you the feeling of this fully integrated suite of tools that you could use to build a SaaS app. You didn't have to reach outside of the main tools a huge amount. Like for instance, testing was just built in. You're like, oh, I'm going to build a Rails app. Here's what I'm using for tests. And that's not as much the case in the JavaScript world. Or what ORM am I going to use? It's just sort of set for you. It's all integrated so that you don't have to think about it. You don't have to go evaluate 17 different ORMs. You just are like, oh, I'm using Rails. I'm using Active Record. Okay. And Redwood right. and, JS and is, is the that's, same. That's my question: is that we already have that? So we it seems it seems we already have the market for that, and we already have the product for that. You mean Rails? Yeah, sure. The only problem with Rails is that you have to use Ruby to write it. Which, if you look at the, the I numbers don't see of that developers, <laughs> I'm, I'm going I'm to agree with Chuck on this one. Ruby, I love Ruby. To be fair. Okay, I love Ruby and I love Rails, but there's a lot more developers writing JavaScript and TypeScript today. So there are opportunities yeah. in the developer landscape to service those developers that are sort of optimizing their career path for using JavaScript and TypeScript. And that is a tremendous number of people. It's just incredible how many developers are choosing that path today because you can write website code, you can write server side code, you can write command line tools, you can write pretty much anything you want to write these days using Node and using you know, the browser runtimes that JavaScript, TypeScript sort of run in these days to build everything. It's the whole thing. It's everywhere, all the time, all at once. Every, I totally agree with everything you said. And on top of that is that tight integration with the front-end framework, uh, which you just don't have when you use a language on the back-end which is not JavaScript or TypeScript. There's something nice about having a unified language front end and back end, right? Like when you're writing Ruby, if you're writing Rails, you're writing Ruby, but you're also going to be writing some JavaScript, which is generally not a huge problem. But if you could reduce the number of languages that you use in your project, that would be nice, mm -hmm. right? It's not a deal breaker, certainly, but you'd prefer all other things being equal to use fewer languages than more languages. I, but I it's not just the language. True. But it's not just the language. It's also the templating. It's the fact that you don't need to implement the HTML templating hmm. in two different mechanisms to re to effectively recreate some of the same tem templates in two distinct programming languages using distinct frameworks. Right, and that I think is the beauty of React that React really helped solve that problem. And this is where Rails sort of fell behind. And we could talk about where Rails is now and they've solved some of these problems. But for many years, Rails sort of completely ignored the JavaScript, the evolution of JavaScript. And so things like React came along and Rails was just put on blinders and was like, I see nothing. I see nothing <laughs> new in the JavaScript world. And it was really pretty shocking to me. And I think they lost a lot of people because of that. People who were like, React is amazing like this unidirectional flow of information like the ability to prototype out your components in isolation using something like storybook which is amazing to me right you don't have to you don't have to load your whole app in order to build a new component you can just sort of mock the data that goes into it you can press buttons and twiddle all of the different fields that there are like it's such a tremendous thing to be able to do to isolate it in that way anyway but rails is you know overdoing the thing that it's always been doing with erb and whatnot and and that that lack of keeping up with the javascript world to me that was part of why i sort of wandered off is that at a previous startup after github um 
Scott Chacon and I, another GitHub co-founder, we worked mm -hmm. on this project called Chatterbug, which is a language learning platform. If you want to learn German or French, you can oh. go there today, actually, chatterbug.com. You can go to learn these languages. So we started building it with Rails in the traditional way using ERB and everything. Then we brought on a developer slash designer who wanted to build with React. And we were like, okay, yeah, React is modern. Let's, you know, let's, let's use your prowess to start building in React. And so more and more of the front end became React. And that was really nice. And then something interesting happened. We needed a mobile application. And so we built a mobile app using React Native. We also built a GraphQL backend to then serve the mobile application. And so now we had the front end of the web app being primarily React and a mobile application consuming GraphQL. The interesting thing was that the front end developers started to prefer using the GraphQL API even within the web application itself. So that GraphQL was consuming, or sorry, that the, the web front end that was being served with Rails, that was a React app, was consuming directly from GraphQL and not asking Rails for information anymore. So we're bypassing Rails almost entirely. It was just serving assets at that point. Mm. And so this architecture- I'm just going to chime in here and say that GraphQL and Rails is still a giant pain in the rear end. <laughs> oh, yeah, like that's true, I think, for, for everything Java. except JavaScript. Yeah. It's true for yeah, everything well, except Apollo, I think. Right, right. More specifically. And, this, and so this is why you see some of these decisions reflected in Redwood. So Redwood is actually informed out of some of this work with Chatterbug, where we, we made these, we had these learnings that like, wow, it's actually really nice because then you don't need multiple backends to do stuff, right? Because what we were doing is being like, all right, we have one backend that is Rails, and then we have a separate backend that is a GraphQL API, and now we got to keep these two kind of synchronized. But eventually, we ended up just having pretty much the GraphQL API backend that was serving all of the clients, the web client and the mobile client. And this architecture, I thought, was pretty cool. Um, and so that's partly why Redwood JS looks the way it does today, which uses GraphQL. So it's a React app on the front end that consumes data from a GraphQL API backend that's all written, you know, it's all written in TypeScript or JavaScript if you want. And, and so that's, that's the architecture. And this part of the reason, not the reason anymore, but part of the reason too that uh, Redwood looks the way it does is because that works, that architecture works really well in a serverless environment. And I wanted to be able to deploy full stack applications to Netlify because I worked with them since it was just the two founders and I've been an investor all along and I'm on the board. So I was really, I wanted to find a way to build a, a framework to make it easy to deploy full stack applications on Netlify. Now that turns out to not work as well as I wanted it to, mostly because of <laughs> Lambda functions have not evolved almost at all since in the last five years. Um, but right now the focus has become more server full. It, so you can still use Redwood in either environment, uh, but we focus more now on really good performance and server full environments. So who exactly was your target audience with Redwood? Obviously yourselves, but you didn't just create a framework for your own specific use. You were, I think, thinking, you know, a wider scale. So aside from the Netlify based deployment, what you know, like, what was your focus? Initially, it was really anyone that wanted a smoother path to a full stack web application framework. Mm -hmm. What we found as we made a more sophisticated framework was that, and especially one that used GraphQL, is that we needed more sophisticated kinds of players, people that, that knew more about more of the stack and were willing to invest the additional time up front in order to get the long-term benefits of using something like this architecture of React, GraphQL, use Prisma on the back end. Because it's more difficult to, to experiment with that stack than it is with something like Next.js. Right? You, can, you can spin up a Next.js thing in like five seconds. With Redwood, it takes a little longer, right? because you got to go through the, the GraphQL, the generation of the GraphQL. SDLs and, and stuff, right? So, but the advantages that you can get from that are really great. And so we started focusing on startups. So the marketing message today, kind of the ideal profile of a user today is looks more like a startup, someone that is willing to put in more effort up front to get these really nice benefits long-term and be able to hire people that understand and know how to use Redwood and the stack. And that's worked really well. 
but I'm not satisfied with that because it's it's too difficult to get into Redwood today. And that's a big reason why we're going all in on React Server Components is one of the big reasons is that it allows us to not need to use GraphQL anymore. You'll be able to talk directly to the server in the so, server side components and not have to use GraphQL at all in your Redwood JS application. So I will get into that and dig into that, I promise, but I want to pull us back slightly because sure. it kind of stems from a blog post that apparently you put out in May, but I only noticed ahead of our of this recording, which is about the the new epoch or the next epoch from for Redwood JS. And reading throughout this entire uh, blog post, first of all, I understand that that it's not yet something that exists. It's your roadmap going forward, correct? Correct. Yes. Uh, but that you're already working on it. Oh yeah. We've been, yeah, we have simple versions of React Server Components working in Redwood today, yes. So it seems to me that in a lot of ways, and you might disagree or agree, you're doing a sort of an almost about face on, on, on some of your core previous decisions, which leads me to kind of ask, is this the official death of the gem stack? <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> Um, that's a, that's a fine question. That's a really great question for me, actually, because I was, I was part of the conversation for where Jamstack came from talking to Chris and Matt founders of Netlify when they were actually talking about like, should we create this term to help people clarify what this architecture is that Netlify was really making it easy to produce and call it the Jamstack. So I was, I was there at the, at the birth of the Jamstack. I think like with most technologies, it's not that it's not so much that the Jamstack is dead. Like it, it, okay, let's say it this way. Maybe the Jamstack is dead in the same way that Ajax is dead in that Ajax is not dead. It just became everything. It's just a part of how things work now. It is one of the, I, I see, I see furrowed brows. So Ajax, <laughs> right? Well, I mean, Ajax I it... for for those young listeners out there, <laughs> Ajax was so so the first real big use of Ajax to me was Google Maps, right? Google Maps came out with the ability to like pan around your map on your computer, and it would just pull in like new tiles, and it was mind blowing. Like this is this was a thing that almost nobody did at the time, right? Like you couldn't do that, you couldn't just pan a thing around and have stuff load in like asynchronously. And so Ajax made that possible. And the only reason that Ajax is as popular or became as popular as it did is because it had a name that allowed people to understand what it meant. So you'd be like, how did you do that? How did Google Maps do that? Oh, well, they used Ajax. I'm like, what is Ajax? So you go look it up and you're like, oh, it's how you use XML HTTP request to pull in data asynchronously from a web browser. Well, and so it had a name. Here's the thing you got to remember, though, is they X stood for XML. I mean, I know, that alone was, was pretty yeah. thing. In Fine, the Drupal the, world, in the Drupal world, they changed the acronym to like "aha." I can't remember what it was, but it was to, to simplify that it didn't have to be XML; it could be some other source. Yeah, yeah, of but, course. Uh, but I mean, it it evolved, right? Like the way right. that we started using AJAX and and XML HTTP request was to to send you know JSON and other stuff. And, and to XML be fair, was, was not important. And to be fair, or, or to be honest, I think the vast majority of web developers these days would not even know what AJAX stands for. Well, right. for those so of us that are just, old enough. And that's my, that's my point entirely, is that we all use Ajax all day, every day. That is how the web works. And I'm suggesting that Jamstack is similar in that well, many, many websites will use that architecture, but it doesn't necessarily need a name anymore because everybody understands that architecture now. So for those of us who are old enough, we remember it as a cleaning product. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. An abrasive so cleaning you, product. Also, so you can could I... Do yeah, so just a question. I think it just required kind of sorry for barging in, but could you define the gem stack from your perspective? I think the the latest version of gem stack that we all know today is an architecture where you're you're statically delivering most of the content. So you're doing a lot of pre-building. So this is really useful for content sites. And then you're using JavaScript to pull in information on top of that to make it um to make it interactive as a as an as an enhancement right but you get the security benefits and performance benefits of having statically generated content 
Meanwhile, so, you can make it interactive, right? So from your perspective, the gem stack is tied to the concept of uh, static site generation or SSG. Well, that's part of it, right? But things like Netlify and Vercel have made it so that you can do more advanced things. You build in a lot of caching so that you can do real-time updates. You don't have to pre-build everything, right? You can do stale while revalidate. You can do different techniques, but they're all based around generally um, executing something in advance and, and either caching it or doing it in advance, um, or, you know, real-time caching. So if you have a like a giant product catalog, you don't want to pre-generate 5 million pages. It would take forever. So you wait until someone requests them, you generate it, and you cache that response. It ends up being sort of a similar behavior. It's just that you're waiting until someone actually wants the content to do it. So it's a that's, lot more complicated now. And that's why, that's why I think Jamstack is losing its appeal because it's, it's so much more than that. The techniques have blossomed in a way that you can't just be like, oh yeah, it's static sites with JavaScript. So what you you had just mentioned that's kind of the WordPress WordPress plus varnish approach, right? Yes. You wait yes, until it's exactly. Yeah. So. Right. And so yeah, so things like WordPress have also had enhancements where they're like, oh yeah, like it doesn't make sense to regenerate a blog post every time someone requests it, right? Like the, there there are solutions that have been created for the WordPress problem, right? You just do it in a different way. It looks like caching, you know. All right, I'm going to derail this back onto Redwood. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, isn't that where we've been the whole time? Well, we're, we're talking about Jamstack, and we're talking about, I mean, we're, we're kind of laying some of the planks, but I really want to get to, okay, so, you know, Jam, or not Jamstack. You guys messed me up. So Redwood <laughs> solves a lot of these problems, right? It uses kind of these best of breed technologies. You're putting this uh, stuff together. You know, you have a way a redwood js way of doing things um right and so people can go check it out and i encourage you to go check it out because it's always interesting to see what folks are doing and you know even if you don't wind up using redwood you can pick up some of the tech tools that they're putting together for you um but yeah so what what problems are you seeing going forward right because we've kind of talked about jamstack solve some of these problems and some of these other things solve the problem so what are you seeing coming and why are you pulling in some of these solutions for Redwood JS going forward? And why are those the solutions that you picked? That that's what I want to get into, right? I mean, the past is fun, but the future is really interesting. Yeah. Well, there's two big reasons. So number one is React itself. So the React team has made pretty clear that the future of React is React server components. Mm -hmm. That's all they talk about. That's all that they write about. They, they're doing a ton of work to get people on board. They're working very closely with Next.js and other framework providers like us to get versions of, Re of React server components out there into people's hands so that they can start using it and understanding what that means and how React is going to evolve over time. So number one, right? Like if you want to be a React framework, you're probably going to need to support it in some kind of way. Unless That's you're Remix. <laughs> well, I I think I'm, you'll probably see them supporting it too. Yeah, I, mean, I know, I've I know. Seen... I'm just uh, I'm just making fun <laughs> of them because they kind of they kind of looked at it and said, yeah, not now. Uh, but I, I totally agree that eventually they'll 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 you know they'll adopt it, like it or not. Uh, like you said, it's the future of React. I agree with that. Uh, but for now, they're they're holding off on it. So I was just you know yeah make make. Yes, Jabbing fun. It's, a, it's a fair point. Making... Yes, they, they did not initially like it. And I think that's fine, right? I'm not saying that everybody has to go and implement React Server Components. Every project can do or do not as they wish. This is the beauty of open source and new projects and whatever, right? But React community, the React team, I think is going to be paying more attention to frameworks that support it than to frameworks that do not, as well as users, right? Users are going to be like, I expect to be able to use React Server Components. And if you can't, Support that for me, then I'll go find something that does. I agree. So that's point number one. Point number two is we were looking a lot at how to solve problems around um, uh, server-side rendering. So as a as a SPA, a single page application framework, um, Redwood. That's how Redwood started, and that architecture works really well. But it has some downsides. One of the downsides is doing things like 
putting OG tags on a page. So OG tags are open graph tags. That's what allow URLs to unfurl in things like Twitter and Slack and other places where you get a little preview, right? You get like an image and a description of the page. In order to do that, you need to be able to put those header tags into the page and serve them with the first delivery of HTML. The very first delivery has to be there. It can't be added by JavaScript later on because the things that consume it are gonna just do like a curl essentially. And they're gonna be like, all right, here's my page. And if you're a pure SPA with React, then there's nothing really on your page except a div that's gonna be replaced by what React decides to do later on. So problems like this require some kind of a server side rendering, right? The server has to render the page, it has to get the header tags, and then ship all that down as HTML to whoever's asking for it, for things like OG tags and for SEO performance. These are things that people rightfully want, right? Like these are desirable things to be able to do. So with Redwood, as we were attempting to implement some kind of SSR, then React Server Components is also becoming a thing. And so we're looking at it and saying, should we use React Server Components to solve our SSR kinds of problems? Or should we be rolling our own thing using data loaders or a pattern that maybe looks a little bit more like Remix? And we decided that React Server Components becoming obviously the future of React, that we should really double down on React Server Components, use them to solve our server-side rendering needs, and at the same time, be able to offer people a way to fetch their data that did not require using GraphQL. Because as much as I love GraphQL, and as good as it is for a certain set of problems, it also comes with downsides. This is, this is technology in general. Everything's upsides and downsides. There's always pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. We're always making trade-offs. So the trade-off with GraphQL is that it's, it's an amazing multi-purpose API that is super great for front-end developers to use. The downside is that you have more work to do by defining your SDLs, your, your, your definition language of what your, you know, your, your protocol looks like as well as performance and security ramifications in building a GraphQL API. Like it's not trivial. When you do it right, it's amazing, but it takes some effort to do it right. The problem for us with Redwood is that it's a barrier to entry that we feel is reducing sort of conversion of the funnel. Like you, you're like, Redwood JS, integrated full stack web framework. That seems awesome. I'll use that. Like, why would I not? And then you get to the part where it's like, oh, now here's how you use GraphQL. And you're like, I don't know how GraphQL works. And then you learn enough to know that it makes the, the process take a little more time. And we would love for Redwood JS to be a direct competitor to things like Next.js, where you'd use it for a hackathon, where the primary goal is to get something done fast, to prototype, just hack it out, get something done. And the big reason for that is that most people start their projects like that with an idea, some random thing that they want to try out. And then they may keep going. And if they keep going, they're probably going to just keep using what they started with. And if they started with Next.js, then they're going to keep using Next.js. And Next.js is wonderful. It's a really amazing tool and they've paved a lot of ground and made a lot of innovations. But it's one tiny piece of what you need to build a SaaS application. We'd love to give people more advantages more out of the box than Next.js does so that if they do choose to keep going, they have all those tools at their fingertips instead of having to figure out how to add them all. And so if we can make Redwood JS as easy to use for a hackathon as Next.js, then we think that we can improve a lot of developers' lives and help them go faster and build more of what they're interested in, which is their app, and less of what they're not interested in, which is building a web application framework. So since you brought it, uh, you brought uh, Redwood as an alternative to Next.js and people, as you kind of indicated, or, you know, by default, when they think about React, React server components and a React quote unquote meta framework these days, they probably think of Next.js. Uh, what are the advantages that Redwood JS brings on, you know, that should make or would make me choose it rather than just going with the quote-unquote default. Yeah, so I've mentioned a lot of them before, but it's being opinionated about the stack of technologies that you're going to use. So even if you're using React Server Components, you're still going to be using Prisma out of the box. So Prisma is integrated, as well as testing with Jest, 
and a mocking framework that allows you to use those things in your tests and mock out API calls and things like that in a much more natural way than trying to just bolt them on. Like the amount of work that we've done to integrate these things is quite a lot. And if you're doing them on your own, it takes a very long time. But let me just say, even without GraphQL, the ability to say, I'm not going to use GraphQL today, but someday I might like to build a mobile application, some kind of third party client. And it would be really nice to use GraphQL in that use case. And having first class GraphQL API support available in the same framework that you're using to build your web application as, a, as an add-on later on, to me represents a, a pretty massive benefit over something that's much more specific and small like Next.js. So why, why bother with an abstraction layer? Why not just get right to the core of it and say, okay, Postgres. Why, why the, the, so this is, this seems like a paradox because if you compare and contrast databases and you're like, well, are we going to pay a hundred million dollars per month for Oracle? Or are we going to just suffer through ambiguous error codes with MySQL? Are we going to use the right database Postgres? You know, like why even, <laughs> why even make people go through all of that trouble rather than just saying, look, here's the baked in solution. It's totally baked in. You don't have to futz around. And then you actually get to take advantage of your database. So, so let's even say that you didn't use Postgres, you use something else. Every database has some sort of advantage to it that if you use that advantage, then duh, you get the advantage of it. But if you abstract it away, then you get no advantage. And then it's like, well, why bother picking a database in the first place? So why, why not just go straight to the database rather than say, oh, we're going to handle the abstraction layer? I think that's a I think that's a fine question and that's that's absolutely true I think to some degree. Now any any decent ORM is going to allow you to write raw SQL statements. And, and at that point a, there's no point in using directly. the ORM. Right? Well, that, if you if well, you hit the drop down to raw SQL statements then just use the SQL and not have all the convoluted stuff in between. That's true if you had to make the decision to do one or the other, but often you can get advantage of most of the benefits of the ORM in the easy cases where you're able to do most normal things that you want to do without writing raw SQL and have the, the, the negatives of using raw SQL, you can get everything that's really nice about the ORM in most cases and where you want to dive down into the specifics of a, a specific database, then you might have to use raw SQL to do that. And that is okay. You're not going to get the sort of advantages of using the, the ORM and the tools that it builds, the abstractions that it gives you on top of that. Right. I'm just saying it's not 100%. You don't have to choose 100% one or the other. But I mean, yeah, I mean, if you want to write C raw SQL all day long, I think that that's a that's a fine thing to do. And there are certainly advantages to doing that. Is it worth well, most on, people? It, it's not just like about writing R. raw SQL. It's about picking something that is actually geared to take advantage of the benefits of a specific thing. Right. So Prisma is not going to give you any advantages. Right. It's you're not going to get any benefit out of Prisma, whether you pick Postgres or Oracle or MS SQL. Is right? it worthwhile maybe for at least some of our listeners to explain what ORM is and what Prisma does? Um, or does everybody or can we assume that everybody knows? I, I think we ought to. I don't think people know. I think even people well, that think they know don't know. Yeah, let's just keep it brief because I still I, I want to stay on. Redwood. Sure. Make sure well, we're covering a, what's going on. I can take a stab there. at it for you. So, Prisma is an ORM, an, an object relational mapper for a database that says you can write code essentially that's not SQL, right? You're writing JavaScript, TypeScript code to ask for information from your database. In this case, if you're using a relational database like Postgres, MySQL. Um, then you write code to do that, and then you get a JavaScript object that contains the, the data from your database in a way that is easy to consume in your language of choice, in this case, JavaScript, TypeScript. Prisma goes to great lengths to guarantee type safety. So you get that if you're using TypeScript. You get to know that the data types that are coming out of your database are going to be what you expect in your language. So that would be an advantage of using an ORM in this case, is if you've got a string type in your database, 
then you'll know that that's going to be represented as a string type in your TypeScript application, and you don't get confused about what the types are. So a lot of people really enjoy the type safety there, as well as defining relationships and being able to traverse relationships. That's something that you would have to do much more manually if you're using raw SQL. So you can say this this key on this table represents um, a foreign key on another table, and now you can traverse those relationships using the ORM much more simply than you can by having to explicitly define all the joins and everything yourself every time that you're writing raw SQL. So these are some of the big advantages of using an ORM like Prisma. I think Prisma does a really good job. It also allows you, I mean, this is unlikely, but if you did need to change a database at some point, if you needed to switch from MySQL to Postgres, and this does happen from time to time, especially in an age where we have things like Planet Scale and Terso and uh, Fauna, and you know, there's so many, you know, Neon. There's so many different providers that being able to switch from one to the other, and I've seen it happen. Don't say it never happens. I just I'm saw it happen with, it a, never happens, with a company I, the other I day. Think it's, I think it's like saying you shouldn't get in a car because you might get in a car crash, right? Or you shouldn't get in a plane because you might no. get in a plane crash. I agree. Like I it, agree. It, That's a tertiary. I, people advantage. bring it up, and and I think that it does a disservice to anyone listening in the same way it would do a disservice to people listening to talk about the dangers of planes. There's nothing really that says an ORM can't create specialized features for specific databases. And I actually would need to go look for Prisma, but I would be unsurprised if it, it allows you to use some of the specialized features I, of Postgres. Directly. I, over the last couple of years, I've become more and more red-pilled that like you have to learn the SQL anyway, and there's so many benefits of learning it that it just doesn't make sense to pretend like it's some sort of scary thing. I mean, if you don't get SQL, you fundamentally don't get concepts of, of programming that that you would benefit by, you know, learning those. Because it, it's it's a language, it it has some strange characteristics, you know, you don't really do loops to you've got like i like group by is you know there's, there's there's some things that have nuance to them that are really frustrating but at the same time there's so many frustrations in learning an orm and there's so many more orms than there are d databases right you're you're much more likely over the course of your career over the course of you know 20 years to use 50 different orms well whatever the number is, right? Use a different ORM at every job than you are to use a different database at every job. Yeah, There's a true. finite number of databases and an infinite number of ORMs. Each ORM is incomplete. Each ORM has hundreds or thousands of open issues. And so, and each ORM makes it difficult for you to take advantage of what the database would do easily, natively. And if there were an ORM that was like a full-on, let's say that it was MySQL. Let's say it's just a full-on MySQL ORM. Heaven forbid that they, you know, didn't choose Postgres. But, but I could get behind that philosophically in the same way that I can philosophically get behind something that says there's no JavaScript. It's just TypeScript. We do TypeScript. Like, pick a path, optimize for the path you pick. You know. Anyway, so that that's I'm I get that. SQL builders can be convenient when you're learning, especially if it has like a, a two query or a two string method where you can see what it generated so you can learn. But I, I'm, I'm more from like, my curiosity is more like you're trying to streamline this, you're trying to make it great. Um, you know, why not just go down to the database and then they don't have to deal with all that planet scale or whatever, because every single, every single platform is going to have Essentially, I, I think Postgres has kind of become the universal database. Even even platforms that that have something that's a modified version of Postgres, like Cockroach or whatever, they all have a Postgres adapter. So you end up using Postgres commands. Yeah, I I think your viewpoint is totally valid. I think if you want to use SQL directly, that that's well, a fine but I'm not I'm not saying it. that the SQL directly is the viewpoint. I'm saying pick the database is the viewpoint. I personally yeah. have come to the the you know let SQL's not an enemy it's a friend but I'm saying rather than pick an abstraction layer the prisma pick some like say we use pg sql or or whatever 
like you keep keep an abstraction layer if that makes sense which i'm whether that makes sense or not is totally up for debate yeah. i think there's good arguments on both sides but pick an abstraction layer that is about a specific thing not like two or three times removed yeah that that's what i'm that's what i'm questioning yeah well i'll give you some history here as well is that at the time that we were building Redwood JS a couple of years ago, looking for an ORM, because I do like using an ORM. I do find that the ergonomics of using it can be excellent. And I think Active Record from Rails is the best ORM, hands down, 100%. Nothing can touch Active Record today. Like, even it's like 100x better than anything else out there. So I'll put that out there first. I like the advantages of using an ORM. At the time, there was very little that was good in the JavaScript world at all. And then Prisma came hmm. around and they started developing, this is like three years ago now, four years ago probably. And they looked like an ORM that finally could be one that was good. Like the, the choices that they were making in how you built things like relationships with, between models actually made sense, more sense than anything else I'd seen in that in the ORM space. And so we chose it because of that. And we've been working with them actively to try to make it the best ORM that it can be. And I think that there's still, there's still challenges there. I won't, I won't say that there's not, there's limitations and challenges to using an ORM. And I'd love for Prisma to be even better than it is today. But at the same time, it allows us to give people choices that allow them to not use that as a reason to not use the framework. So, so this is, when building a framework, you have to decide where your line is on your opinionation. So you could say, why don't you just use Tailwind CSS as your CSS solution and integrate it like super great. And that's the choice that everyone has to make if they use it. This is maybe an easier call to make today. You might, I think you could probably reasonably make that call and not alienate huge amounts of your potential users because it's such a popular thing. But three years ago, it was not at all, right? And so if you say you have to use Tailwind in order to use Redwood, guess what? You're not gonna get anyone to use your framework that doesn't wanna use Tailwind. Likewise, for a database, if you say you have to use Postgres, then yeah, like that, that works pretty well and even better today than, it, you know, likewise, Postgres has become a better and better database, a, a more and more easy default choice. Um, but I think that you still alienate those people that want to use planet scale, for instance. I, I, I think I'm going to push us back to the main discussion. I think, <laughs> I think this is an interesting debate to have, but um, I, I think our listeners are going to want to know what, um, you know, what other things are coming with Redwood. And then maybe yeah. we can have Tom back to discuss the ins and outs of ORM design, or maybe have somebody from Prisma <laughs> on. Cause I, I think it's there an interesting go. discussion, but. I don't think that's what people are going to be tapping our uh, episode to, to pick up. Well, and that, that's and that actually kind of my point is that people that don't care about the database don't care about the database. Uh, it's like yeah. Tailwind is something that people who are going to use Redwood probably. I, 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 my guess is that you have more people have more opinions that are using Redwood more people have more opinions about diverse front-end technologies they want to use than diverse back-end technologies they want to use because you've almost specified the back-end the whole way through. Yeah, true. Yeah. No, I mean, focusing on a single database, I think, could be a reasonable thing to do. So uh, to pull us back towards uh, Redwood itself, um, so you're making some significant architectural changes in this uh, next epoch of of Redwood, which I gather is called Redwood JS Bighorn, and Correct. so the obvious question is, what happens to those people who are using the existing version of Redwood? Like, what what is the transition story for them? Migration. Story? Our hope, our hope is that they continue to be able to use Redwood JS via an upgrade path that is not too difficult. We're trying to not completely break how Redwood JS works for those that are using it. So if you're using the GraphQL, the current kind of GraphQL based version, 
then that will continue to work because we'll continue to support GraphQL and make it better. In fact, we're adding real-time GraphQL support now. Mm. That's actually in, nice. I think, 6.0, the 6, the 6 point X version. Um, so we'll continue to make the GraphQL support better and better, and, and we have new improvements to the sort of playground for using GraphQL that, that integrates it with the authentication so you can get you can be authenticated in your GraphQL queries, et cetera. So we're going to continue pushing GraphQL as so, an option for those people that want to use it. Can you would can you talk more about that authentication bit? Because that I know that's been a huge problem for people historically, and I don't know if it still is generally, but that getting granular permission on that. How do you? What's your on, approach on that? How do on you GraphQL calls in general? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with with Redwood, you have the ability to create what we call directives very easily. So that's how you do authentication in your SDL. So you just define these directives that you can add to any GraphQL query or mutation that then basically trigger code to be called that runs through and can, can de you know, determine authentication on any specific query or field. And, and that's where your authentication so you got is it, you got it to the field level. Um, you can do it at the field. I mean, you have to go essentially, yes. I mean, you have to do work to do that but you can put it on any field on a in your sdl okay and did we actually define sdl already i know it's definition language but what was the s on that schema definition language okay is schema the, is how graphql defines the 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 api that you're going to use right so it says here's the names of the queries and the mutations um and their types it's interesting to see how with things like uh, React server components and other solutions, RPC is kind of making a comeback <laughs> and kind of replacing to an extent, you know, prevalent web APIs like uh, GraphQL or RESTful APIs in a way. But I, but yeah. I think that's like a discussion, a whole other discussion. Um, Once again, the old has become new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually thinking about proposing a talk to conferences about that, about the the return the the return of our of RPC. Uh, that's kind of happening a under the radar of a lot of web developers. Like they're using or they'll be using RPC without even realizing it's RPC. But but again, that's a different discussion. Again, going back to Redwood JS itself. Um, I know that a part of the challenge of adopting React server components, be it in Next.js and I assume in any frame, meta framework that chooses to adopt it, is the building slash bundling slash deployment story around it. That's kind mm -hmm. of fairly challenging. And, 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 and to an extent, I think that React server components is, isn't even fully spec'd yet, at least the upstream part, because of some of these challenges, like uh, the what what do they call them, like server functions or server actions, isn't now like totally done yet. So how are you going to be dealing with that? Uh, well, it's by having a good relationship with the React team. So we're we're we work closely with them. We're in channels where they work with framework developers and. It's been really great to to get to know them better, and and but this is a challenge in that it is not specified as well as one would prefer. There's sort of a reference implementation, if you will, in Next.js. Um, we're using Vite as the bundler, so we also work with the Vite folks to make yeah. sure that the support is going to be there. That's something that we're working on uh, with them. But it's it's challenging. I'm not going to lie; like there are challenges in getting React server components implemented, but we find it important to be there to be at the table as it's being developed because it's important to our framework and we think that we can help make it better by saying here's how redwood works here's what we think developers are going to want here's the ergonomics that we're going for how can we make sure that react server components is going to work the way that we need it to like there are certain things that we do with redwood there's a pattern called cells that we use which you use for data fetching it makes data fetching with graphql really easy we intend to use cells as well as the sort of data fetching primitive for React server components, where now you're maybe doing that fetching server side instead of over a GraphQL mm. uh, API. We'd like them to work essentially the same. And there's some things that we're going to have to do in order to make that work the way that we want as far as defining loaders and 
like the, you know, loading skeletons for, for when um, you're making a request that's not done directly server side on the first page load. Anyway, like there's a lot of specifics around how this stuff is implemented, but it's really about having the right relationships, being in the right rooms where the conversations are happening and having access to the people that are working on the code so that we can say, hey, like we're getting this thing across the wire that we can't figure out why it's there or what it's for. And being able to get some insight into that because there's not a sort of a, a giant spec that we can read and say, you know, here's the what they call flight. Flight is the the streamed information that goes back and forth um, between the, the server to the client. The, the flight information comes down and it's sort of this compressed sort of JavaScript-y thing. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, it's, it's pro own, custom protocol. It's its, own separate, it's, it's its own separate thing, right? But it eventually gets converted into JavaScript and, and then makes modifications to the page. And this is part of the streaming that comes along with uh, this, the modern versions of React, right? The streaming aspect is as important as the SSR aspect. Uh, in order for React server components to function the way that they do. And it's really very cool. Like they've done an awesome job. The enhancements that you can get, like the, the choices that you can make as far as what the user perceives and where you want to do things server side rendered, where you want to wait for part of the page to load and stream those down on the same connection. Like you get these progressive enhancement kind of characteristics in a really slick way, but they're quite challenging to implement. Yeah. I would say that one sort of meta question is um, you know the React team is is looking at React as a whole, right? And so you're looking for stuff that's maybe more specific to Redwood. That's got to be quite the balancing act for them to say, okay, how can we help out Redwood here? They're important while at the same time still helping out the rest of the React base and not maybe alienating some people. Does that yeah. make sense? Well, I think it's really important. I mean, we're essentially design partners with them now, right? It's like any any startup's gonna that's building a product is gonna need design partners, essentially early adopters that say, "Hey, we'll take the extra effort to work with you to help you make your product better by telling you what we need." Right? Any any project, any any solution is gonna need real world information in order to not just be some abstract thing that nobody actually can use, it needs to run into reality and get feedback. And so that's what we're there for as well as Next and the other frameworks that are working on React Server Components is to say, we need to do this thing because it's important for us. And they'll be like, oh, we didn't think that anyone would need to do that thing. That's useful information. Let's figure out how to make that thing happen for you. So it's really, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a two-way street. Like they want to make something usable we want to use their their technology to make developers' lives better. So it's really a collaboration. Uh, at this point in time, I think it's also worth uh, mentioning and reminding our listeners that we had a great double episode with uh, Dan Abramov and Joe Savona from Meta. Well, Joe is still at Meta um, about React server components. So it were it was episodes uh, 582 and 583. So if people are, are interested in understanding like the deep details of how this thing works, I highly recommend listening to that. Um, by the way, talking about the fact that you're built on top of Vite, which seems to be like the default choice for most, not all, but most meta frameworks these days, uh, it seems that some of them are even going up one level, as it were, like thinking about Solid Start, you know, built by Ryan Corniato, and are moving mm -hmm. from Vite to being built on top of Astro, because Astro itself is built mm -hmm. on top of Vite. So it's like, right. you know, going one level up. Is that something you might also consider? That's probably unlikely. We, we, there's very specific things that we need to do, and having a, having something in the middle probably makes that more difficult. We're actually just now migrating from... Uh, Webpack. So we, we have historically used Webpack and the latest version of Redwood makes Vite the default now. It's a transition period that we're undergoing so that we don't rile too many Redwood users' feathers to go through this transition because it's a little tricky to switch bundlers. And Web, Webpack and Vite are not like, you know, you can't just swap them out. Like it, they do sort of different things and have their own opinions. So I think that we're going to need to use Vite very directly. So I imagine, mm -hmm. I can't imagine what would go in between that we would leverage that would make our lives easier. Uh, I'm guessing that we would use it directly. Yeah, Vite is built on top of Rollup, I believe, for production. Yeah, they use yeah. Rollup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's great. It's fast. 
And, you know, I, I was talking with Evan the other day and like, it's, it's really has a ton of traction. Like he's done an awesome job. Yeah, they for do, sure. They do a really great job. It's great technology. And it, does it make your life easier beside being faster? Yeah. Um, I, that's one of the biggest reasons that we switch to it is that it's just, it's, it's just modern. Like it's getting a lot more attention. Like it's, you always kind of want to be on the thing that is the rocket ship if you can, because <laughs> that's where the people are. That's where the attention is going to go. So speed was obviously a primary concern. It allows us to solve the other problems, but I think speed and just modernity and traction were the biggest yeah. factors. So that's another interesting distinction or difference between uh, Redwood and uh, Next, where you use Veet and they don't. They have like, yeah. what is it, Turbo Pack? What, what, what's the name of the thing that is replacing well, I think web, they, Webpack? I think they still use Webpack mostly, but yeah, they're, they're transitioning to use Turbo Repo. Turbo yep. or something. Is there any other big change that you're looking at in the context of Bighorn aside from uh, the move from SSG to SSR with uh, React Server Components and React Server Components instead of GraphQL for the majority of use cases? Um, well, I'll say you can still, you'll still be able to use SSG in the same way that you do now. You can provide well, pages yeah. if you want to, if they're like full marketing pages. But um, I mean, that's the that's the big one. I mean, there's other things that we're doing at the same time. So we have this uh, part of Redwood called Studio, Redwood Studio. This is where the GraphQL playground lives. So it's this sort of separate app that you can spin up next to your main app that allows you to do things like um, experiment with your GraphQL API directly in a playground. Um, we have open telemetry support built into the framework. Oh, that's and cool. So you can you can fire up uh, Redwood Studio and you can get tracing information directly uh, in the Studio app without having to pay, you know, some third party consumer thing like New Relic or Datadog or whatever to be able to see the performance of your application during development. And especially important to be able to see the SQL queries that are being executed. AJ, you'll like that. Um, so you can go in and you can see exactly how long each of those SQL queries was, was taking to run as well as how many were generated because again, AJ, one of the downsides of ORMs is that they may produce many, many SQL statements where you were assuming it was only going to generate one and you need to be able to know that you need transparency into what the ORM is doing under the hood so that you don't shoot yourself in the foot by creating some extreme order in cubed <laughs> exactly <laughs> right <laughs> so we Rails that never had that as, problem as never never oh, yeah no that's never <laughs> been a problem with any other rm no no that's the, that's a classic problem right so things like that as well we're just now about to release an email integration where um you can you can use a built-in thing with redwood to create and send emails so you hook it up with an external email sender but part of the redwood studio will also be able to run an, an, an SMTP server and locally and be able to send your emails there. So you're getting a full real lifecycle actual email sent from your Redwood JS app into Redwood JS Studio where you can see what emails are being sent as you're doing development. So we're working on a lot of these sort of additional tools that are going to make your life easier as a developer. Things that you would otherwise have to go, you know, use some other random tool, pay for, they'd just be separate. We're trying to bring those kinds of things in to Redwood itself. And I'm super excited about that. And it's just terms, going to make your life as a developer so much easier. And in terms of deployment targets, like, do you support like everybody? Like, We support quite a few deployment targets right now. So you can, you can deploy on Netlify and Vercel serverlessly. You can use a serverless framework with, you know, Amazon. You can use Amazon directly. You can, you can deploy to bare metal if you have your own server co-located somewhere, or this works on AWS as well, but we have a strategy called bare metal where you're just deploying straight to a machine and you may be using PM2 or something to, to keep them up, like, but you're managing the whole thing. We can deploy to render fly.io. We're working on making the Docker deployment stuff work much better and be much faster. So that's been an ongoing development, but anywhere that you can use Docker, you can, uh, you can deploy Redwood too. So there's a ton of, there's a, you can go to the website and find the full list of providers, but we've worked really hard with 
different deployment providers to make it super easy. We're really trying to help you avoid lock-in, vendor lock-in. We want you to be able to move from vendor to vendor. Um, and so that's why we've worked with these, these vendors. And, you know, this is, this is another philosophy of Redwood is trying to go further than Rails ever did. So we integrate authentication from the get-go as well as deployment, things that Rails has never really touched. Trying to say, what's the full life cycle of building and deploying and maintaining a web application today in the JavaScript and TypeScript world and adding all the necessary things to do that well? Yeah, I do have to say that a, a lot of the Rails strategies are still, I mean, you can use Q, Kubi, which will push to Kubernetes, but hmm. yeah, otherwise you're still using Capistrano, which sometimes you need a crystal ball to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have a new thing now, right? Um, Mersk. Mersk. Check I haven't out. used Mersk. Nor have I, but. GPT so will educate us. <laughs> yeah, go, go ask Chat Ch Ch GPT. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that, like these things are, these things are, these things are hard, right? Like deploying is hard, like getting your authentication set up is, is hard, right? You don't want to have to go just find some random library to do it. It's much better if yeah. the framework can say, Hey, like you want to use clerk, here's how you do it. Right. And yeah. we talk to clerk all the time and we make sure that it works properly. One of the biggest motivations for actually using a meta framework as it were. And these days, I think, unless you're like, uh, big organization that has very unique and special needs, then you should be using a meta framework. And one of the big motivations is the whole deployment story, because you don't want to deal with deployments mm -hmm. on your own in most cases. Like uh, we do where I work at Next Insurance, but we can afford to because we have an entire uh, DevOps department. And that's yeah. not something that most organizations can or even want to deal with. It's just not cost effective. Um, in that context, what do you think about edge computing? I think there's a, I think there's a, a lot there. You know, I, early on in Redwood, I wanted Redwood to be kind of an edge framework, but again, the realities of lambdas and things and, and the way that, that we were doing GraphQL made that pretty challenging, but there's a lot of cool things that you can do on the edge. Now, I don't know that that's going to be the main sort of infrastructure that you use to build a SaaS application, but using them to enhance users' experiences and make things faster for them and do customization for them, right? You know, at like last minute before they get the actual HTML from your server. There's some really cool things you can do there around localization and caching and other types of enhancements. So I think we're we're just we're still figuring out what that means. Like, where do those things add more than add more to the user's experience than they add complexity to your life as <laughs> exactly, a developer? Exactly, exactly. Because it's non-zero. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm so happy you said that. I mean, so many times you hear people referring to edge computing as this kind of a silver bullet or like an amazing technology that makes everything better. And it does address some specific use cases amazingly well, but at the end of the day, it does come, as you said, as, as extra complexity because it's not the front end, it's not the back end, it's another layer that you need to contend with. Yeah, and I, I think the, the main challenge that developers have, really, maybe the developer's only job is to manage complexity. Like if you have a long-term project, like a, a company, a startup, whatever you're building, some light, large project, at the end of the day, managing complexity from the technical side, of course, you need to build a product that people actually want to use. But from the technical side, managing complexity is what we as developers should be doing. A good developer manages complexity. That's what makes something maintainable in the long term. Mm -hmm. and, and people overcomplicate things all the time. We love to be <laughs> architecture astronauts, right? Like yeah. we love building complex stuff. We, we love building the blockchain. Man, do we love building the blockchain, right? But then we're like, and now let's use it for everything. And of course, that's not the right solution, right? That's way <laughs> yeah. more complexity than you really need to solve most problems. And I think many people need to remind themselves of that, is that starting out, go for the least complex possible solution to your problem and build up from there. Every working complex thing started as a working simple thing. That's such an amazing statement. 
Totally agree with you. It's not mine. I stole that from I stole that from someone. I don't know. Who. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can find it. And I, I guess that really drives but I think it's true. I think that drives a lot of your decisions around Redwood, right? Because you're you're assuming on yourself a lot of the complexity so that the person using the framework doesn't need to deal with it. Yeah, exactly. It allows you to go further faster because building a website is complex. Like there's some minimum mm -hmm. level of complexity that you're going to get to. If you have to build all of that complexity yourself, then you have to go through all those stages of first creating something very simple, right? Like, and this is the path that if you choose Next.js that you're probably choosing is you choose that simplest thing, Next.js by itself. And then you're like, all right, now I, now I need authentication so I can add you know, user accounts. Okay, now I need to add um, you know, testing because this is complicated enough and I have to add that. Like, you know, every step of the way, you're, you're adding complexity one step at a time. We're hoping with Redwood JS that we can add that complexity for you and go through the steps of turning it from a simple working thing into a more complex working thing that you would have to do yourself anyway, but that we've already done it. And when you're ready for those things, like if you're ready for GraphQL, instead of being like, all right, well, let's evaluate GraphQL server choices. It's just like, oh yeah, GraphQL is built into Redwood. Let's just use that. Cool. We're getting toward the end of our time. Is there anything else you want to make sure people know about? I would love for people to know that we have a conference and I'm actually not sure when this will be airing. So it may not be much notice, but we do have, we will have tickets online. So Redwood JS conference, the first Redwood JS conference um, will be September 26th through 29th in uh, Grants Pass, Oregon, United States. It will also be streamed online. So you can go to redwoodjsconf.com and you can pick up your online tickets there. Um, or your in-person tickets, if there's still time. And uh, we're going to be collecting together a really great group of people in and around web application development. So it's more than just Redwood. Redwood's really an excuse to be there. It's really about everything that you need to build and scale a web application. So we touch on security, uh, GraphQL, of course, uh, design. Uh, we have one of the great designers from GitHub is coming. Um, we have uh, an executive coach who's coming. Like if you're building a company, you'll hear from someone who is really great at teaching you how to do that well. Um, so we have people from all, all sort of different walks of life, AI, and we have some workshops as well. There's going to be an Apollo, an advanced Apollo workshop, a Prisma workshop, and an AI workshop. There's a workshop where you can spend time with myself and one of the other Redwood JS founders to talk through your startup if you're using Redwood JS or if you're looking at using Redwood JS, we can give you advice on building a company or otherwise using Redwood JS. Um, as well as uh, two, two days of talks in the middle, uh, 27th, 28th, and then uh, an optional sort of fun day on the last day in Oregon where we'll go ride mountain bikes or go on a hike or do some other kinds of tours or just hang out at the, at the conference venue and, and, and chat. So it's going to be an awesome time. I'm super looking forward to it. And I'd love for you to join us one way or another. Check it out. Sounds awesome. I'm envious. <laughs> yeah. Get on that plane from uh, from Israel, man. It's not that far. Yeah, right? not that it's far at like all. <laughs> 15 hours. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> yeah. So I have one more question, and I'm just curious. Because, um, I mean, I remember when Microsoft bought GitHub, and I think you own like half of Microsoft now. And so <laughs> I I'm just curious, right, if, you know, I'm I'm imagining what that looked like. Um, and I'm also imagining that this isn't something you have to do, right, in order to make a living. So um, like what what motivates you to keep this going? Is there some other thing that I don't know. What what's motivating you to do this at this point? Well, I just I love building things. It's it's the thing that I love the most, right? I mean, I didn't build GitHub to make a bunch of money. It did, right. and that's nice. But that wasn't the reason. And, and, and money has never been the reason that I build things. I build mm -hmm. things because I love solving problems and I love making people's lives easier. And I love giving people opportunities. And so that's part of this for me as well is building a community. You know, we started this right at the beginning of COVID and it was really pretty awesome. Like so many people I know are like, man, it's so hard to make friends. Like I just like, how do you make friends in your thirties and forties? And I'm like, man, I make new friends all the time through open source, like just doing Redwood JS. I know so many more people around the world 
that are amazing and I have a great time doing it with them. I love creating cool things with my friends. And, you know, I, I can do more of that. I can support more of this. And, you know, a bunch of, we have people working full time on Redwood. There is no company. There is no Redwood JS organization, right. corporate entity, kind of by design. Like I kind of wanted to see what we could build as an open source project if funding it wasn't the main concern. So I fund it myself. And I, and I do that because it's an exploration into what that could look like, what that community could be like. How can we align ourselves with the users of Redwood in a way that we're not just trying to extract value from the users as a, as a, as a corporate entity? This is not to say that I wouldn't love to make money from Redwood JS someday. I think that would be nice. But it's important to me to find the right kinds of ways. I do invest in companies that use Redwood. I have a fund. So I do a lot of angel investing. And I set aside a million dollars to invest in companies that use and are building with Redwood JS. You can go to Redwood JS, uh, what is it? Redwood Startup Fund dot com. Oh, cool. You can read about that. But I love investing in the community. I love the ideas that people are are creating and building with Redwood and being a part of that journey. Um, whether we invest in someone or not, we have a, a Slack channel where we get all the startup founders together and we we run monthly meetings and and chat all the time about building companies. And it's just such a nice way for me to stay involved in the startup scene and, and creating something cool. And like JavaScript and TypeScript is, is so big and powerful and where it's going. And I would love to be a part of the vanguard of defining what that is. Cause I love writing code. I love building websites. There's so much power there. And to be a part of that journey to me is immensely satisfying. Very cool. I did have one other question that I wanted to throw at you with this is you mentioned uh, stuff around building mobile apps with React mm -hmm. Native. So I'm wondering, um, I mean, this, you know, I've, I've been playing with Re uh, Redwood, right? And so you've got your web directory and then you've got your API directory and the API directory is your back end and your web is your front end. Um, yep. I guess my question is, um, do you just, create a separate repo for the React Native app and then just point it at your API and use the same APIs or does it work any different? Yeah, essentially. You could put it in the same repo. I mean, we've toyed with the idea of creating an official kind of mobile application side using React Native. It's something that we will probably do eventually. Right. Uh, we, it, you know, that adds a lot of complexity to the project, like supporting yes. a whole other side. So we haven't, endeavored into that yet but i think it would be really cool to be able to say like oh you want to use redwood to build your web application we'll also use it to build your your mobile application because it's going to integrate mm -hmm. really well and here's where your graphql goes and and yeah it should be that simple right because with graphql everything integrates and there's clients for every language you know right. whether you use react native or swift or whatever like consuming graphql is really really easy so we try to make building your GraphQL API as easy as possible. I think the easiest that you could do it. I don't know of any implementation of a GraphQL API that's better than ours. All right. Well, um, I'm going to push us toward picks and wrapping up. Um, yeah, let's let's go ahead and do the picks. Uh, Steve, what are your picks? So before I get to the high point of every episode, my dad jokes, I do have one pick. Um, Dan. Uh, in your history, Israeli history, do you know the name Ailey Cohen? Yes, of course. Okay. So I've been watching a Netflix special called The Spy. With Sasha about Baron Ailey Cohen? Co yes. Yeah, you just stole my thunder. Huh. So, yes, it's about uh, uh, Ailey Cohen was a Jew, uh, an Israeli spy embedded in Syria from 1961 to 1965. And the uh, story doesn't exactly have a happy ending, but he was very pivotal in a number of a number of uh, things that he was able to, to help the Israeli military with. But the interesting part about the episode is, as Dan mentioned, uh, the lead actor, Sasha Baron Cohen, Cohen, and for the most, Cohen, excuse me, Ailey Cohen, Cohen. Um, you know, most people know him for like the Ali G show or, or Borat, those movies, and he's more of a comedic actor. But in a serious role, he's really quite good. Uh, and it was really a, a well done episode. I'm only, there's one episode left that I have to watch. Uh, there's six episodes. It was a short run series that came out in 2021 on Netflix. But uh, uh, I did some reading on Wikipedia uh, about him and some of the things he did. And it, it's 
pretty historically accurate. The show is as well based on what I've seen. So really great show. Uh, so my, uh, my dad jokes of the week sort of have a theme of uh, interactions with my wife. And I just realized that I've navigated away from my page here. So um, <clears throat> recently, my wife and I were talking about, you know, as we get older, we're talking about what we want to happen when we die. And she asked me why I wanted to be cremated. And I said, well, it's my last hope for a smoking hot body. Mm. And going what? back in, going back in time, uh, when we had little, we had little ones that, you know, have three kids. Uh, when I came home from work one day, my wife said, man, the baby's been crying for hours. Can you take over? I said, sure. And I started crying for hours. <laughs> that one was a little better. <laughs> and then finally, uh, recently her, her, uh, her cat died. She's been a real, she's always been a real big person with cats and started to cheer her up. I went out and got her an identical one. And she said, what am I going to do with two dead cats? <laughs> those are my picks all right yeah. dan what are your picks okay so um first of all i i finished watching uh the the peacemaker show um it's okay it's nice i'll pick it uh action kind of stupid but you know um i, I it seemed like there was supposed to be some social message or something with it but if there was i didn't really get it so it is what it is uh but you know fun action more or less um i also already picked it but i'm going to pick it again a book series uh, that i'm reading it's called uh, the faithful and the fallen uh it's a fantasy book series uh four books and it's complete which is a big advantage for me uh, because I hate it when uh, it turns out that I have to wait an infinite amount of time for the next book in the series to actually come out. Uh, so having one that's actually done is a big plus, and I'm enjoying it. Uh, it's it's not like super deep, but you know, lots of interesting characters, lots of action and adventure and and whatnot. So it's I recommend it. And um, yeah. That and the ongoing war in Ukraine, where you should support the people of Ukraine. Those are my picks for today. All right. Uh, AJ, what are your picks? Well, I've got some good ones here. So I've, I've been perusing the Redwood docs while we were you know, on the, the podcast here. And I, uh, I found a quote in the intermission chapter that I thought was quite great. If you enjoy switching between feeling like the smartest person on earth and the dumbest person in history in the same day, programming may be the career for you. So uh, appreciate your, your uh, humor there on that one. Also, since we have Tom on, and I think that Simver has solved an incredible number of problems. I, th I think Simver is one of the, in the increasing world of complexity that we face where every day there's a new framework and, you know, even Redwood itself is, is on version 6.7. And if you look in your dependency tree, you're going to see a lot of things that are on version 32 or 67 or, or whatever. Uh, Simver. Simver is sane and practical and I have occasionally come across, I, I think maybe in my my career, come across two or three people that have some sort of argument against it, but I think that they're insane. Um because it's just it is it is a necessary tool. And so I pick Simver and I thank you All right. for for uh Great choice. bringing some of the sanity to counteract all of the insanity that you brought to us with allowing people to create social coding. <laughs> <laughs> create the disease and the cure. Uh, yes. Yes. I, I appreciate that you provided a simple cure as well. Um, and then uh, uh, two, two other things, you know, right next to anything about cryptocurrencies, I think the next biggest scam is fulfilled by Amazon and, and similar programs like affiliate marketing fulfilled by Amazon, you know, all, all that. I, I, that's, 
that's I, I don't know in in the Ponzi scheme scam MLM rankings. I I, I definitely think cryptocurrency has taken number one for at least the past five years, and I think that FBA and friends have been uh, at around number two. And I'd I'd love to hear you know if, if somebody thinks something else really is vying for that spot, but. I have a friend who decided to get into FBA and I obviously was uh, questioning, are, have you joined a cult? Uh, are you going bankrupt? Uh, it, so, so I don't know if the specific program is a, uh, one of the scams or not. I suspect it might be, but I in, in doing some research to share, I did find that there is at least one person who has had uh, honest success with it. And so I'm including a link to this video. It's called I Tried Amazon FBA for Six Months, The Honest Results. Now, the problem is that you really need to know what happens over 12 months because uh, there's a lot of forces at play. So, for example once you have a product listed and it's ranking higher then a similar company in China is going to just contract with that company because they don't really have the copyright law and everything and you're small and you know and and then they're going to steal your product and then whatever your product was assuming that you weren't just white labeling because this guy you know speaks honestly about the evils of white labeling and and you know the things that are guaranteed that you will only lose money but even even with the the passion product approach, which sounds like a very reasonable approach, I question what happened after you know twelve months or eighteen months. But basically, the guy was able to break even after about six months, and then ostensibly, based on the six months experience, was able to make one or two thousand dollars a month in actual profit. Well, I, he didn't discuss taxes, so I think you got to take taxes out of it, but you know, around, around a thousand dollars in profit. And so his goal was, I'm going to pay for my single dude rent. And he was able to meet that goal, which I think is a lot more, um, realistic than, you know, these people saying that you're going to make a million dollars when really it's, if you are in the top zero, zero, one percent and sell a million dollars, only 15% of that is your profit after all of the Amazon taxes. And so you're not, like you're making you're making good money, you know, you're making a hundred thousand dollars, whatever. Uh, but it's you know you're not making a million dollars. And then the last pick will be Susanna Venker, who is a relationship coach whose slogan is "Be countercultural." Um, and I just came across some of her her stuff, her podcast, and have been listening to a few episodes and it's, uh, it's, it's bold and based. Okay. Uh, I'm going to throw in my picks here real quick and then we'll get Tom's. Uh, the first one I'm going to pick, I don't remember if I picked this last time I was on, so I'm going to pick it again. And if you get it twice, you get it twice. Uh, but my buddies and I have been playing risk legacy. This is my board game pick. I do a board game pick every time. Um, but I was out of town last week. And so anyway, um, it's been fun. We've, we've done one playthrough. I won. I'll just point that out. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. If you played risk, it's kind of a different, um, different take on it. Um, obviously it's a legacy game, right? So you're marking up the board and, you know, I think you tear up some cards and stuff at some point, but. Anyway, it's just the three of us, and we've we've really been enjoying it. So, I'm gonna pick that, and then um, my wife and I and my kids have all gotten into Wednesday. Uh, it's the Netflix series based on the Adams family, and we're enjoying that. So, I'm gonna pick that as well. And uh, yeah, the last pick I have. Um, so, I drove out to Denver and back um, to podcast movement. That's where I was last week. And there are probably going to be some changes to the show going forward because I picked up a whole bunch of different things that should help us grow, help make the show a little bit, you know, flow a little bit better and get you into it a little faster and things like that. So keep an eye out for that. But when I drove out, we drove out, I drove out uh, uh, I-70 um, through uh, Grand Junction. And the the highway between Grand Junction and Denver is just gorgeous. 
And so if you ever wind up driving up through there, up through Vale and uh, Breckenridge and all that stuff. Anyway, um, it's it's well worth it. And I, I really, really enjoyed it. So I'm going to pick that. Uh, Tom, what are your hey, picks? Chuck, can I tell a quick story? This is so funny about that exact highway. I flew into Grand Junction one time and was going to Alpine, which is up, uh-huh. you know, going up on the West Slope toward it was a, this is a business trip long time ago. And somehow I got going the wrong direction. And so I'm driving along looking for the signs to Breckenridge and Alpine or whatever. And I keep seeing this line that says Utah State Line coming up. I'm like, is that a town or something like that? And then I finally realized, oh, I'm at the Utah State Line. <laughs> you went the wrong way. I went the wrong way. And this is the middle of the night, you know, in a place where yeah. I have never been. So it cracks me up every time I think about Grand Junction. Yeah, there's nothing out there between... Um... So when I drive down, I, I go down Highway 6 and then merge on. I don't take I-15 all the way down. And yeah, there's nothing there. There's nothing there between <laughs> Green River and Grand Junction. So Yeah. All right, Tom, what are your picks? All right, my picks. Okay, well, your, your uh, board game pick reminded me of Monopoly, which is one of the worst games of all time. I hate it <laughs> with all of my being. But <laughs> did you know that there's a card game version of Monopoly called Monopoly Mm -hmm. Deal that one of my friends brought on a trip that we went to recently and we played it a bunch and it's actually delightful. So if you you resented my previous statement and you're like, Monopoly is awesome, then you might really especially love Monopoly Deal because it's Monopoly-esque, but in a way that takes a finite amount of time. Mm -hmm. It's like a 15 minute game it's pretty quick. Like there's like properties and stuff, but it's not really about, you know, it's different. It's nice. It's just a nice card game. It's a quick, fun card game. I like it. AJ is saying something, but I can't hear him. <laughs> yeah, I'll just try. I'll jump in on that one really quickly. So well, the one thing I didn't do is put out the board, board game geek weight on Risk Legacy, which is 2.59, which kind of gets a little bit to the complicated side. Monopoly deal is weighted at 1.08. So it's fast. And it's easy enough that your kids can probably play it with you. Yeah, it's fairly simple. It's nice so I, the thing I was going to ask is, have you ever played Monopoly actually by the rules? I generally play it by the rules and it takes 19 hours. Yeah. Have you ever oh, okay. played Monopoly? <laughs> Am to I completion? not playing it by the rules? It's like the question is, have you ever played Monopoly to completion? I, has anyone ever played Monopoly to completion? No. Well, it, I, what I was going to say I have, is... But... Monopoly actually goes <laughs> quicker without all the house rules. So everybody has all these things that are culturally they do, but that are right. actually not part of the rules. Mm. And if you play it by the rules, it actually goes much quicker. Now, it's not going to be a 30 minute game, but it might be less than two hours. My problem oh, yeah. is that there's really only one strategy in that game. You have to aggressively purchase everything. Yep. And mm-hmm. that's like the only strategy. And I just don't like games where there's, you know, like if you. If you don't play by that strategy, then you are basically screwed. And there's too much luck. I don't like that there's too, there's just too much luck in that game. Anyway. Chuck, what, what's the game where you have a bunch of different types of assets and every turn you get to either take some assets or spend some assets to acquire assets? Um, it's uh, cards. There's... Uh, I mean, there's probably so yeah, many I've played that are so like many that. games that have that. Every <laughs> game <laughs> ever... <laughs> No, but the, the, there's a popular one. <laughs> you think of like one. Settlers of Catan or something? No, there's a popular one. It's, it's card based. I think I think it's card card based because you pull a card, you flip a card over. I think you can flip two cards over at a time, and you can use up to two of them. And then when you're done with your cards, they go back and you rotate through. I mean, that sounds like every card game. But there's there's like a there's a board and there's stuff. There's gold. There's gold and and a, a good naive strategy is to just get as much gold as you can at the beginning of the game. The cones of Dunshire. I, 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 it's it's a really popular one of uh, among like splendor people. or something, and that might be it. That sounds like that could be it. But splendor is strictly cards. I think I don't think it has a board. Oh yeah, I, this one has it has a an area where I think cards are placed, or maybe you put the cards out in front of you. Maybe there isn't. A board. Anyway, I was gonna say. That one is one where you are gathering stuff, but there is a variety of strategies that can win. Yeah. I so sorry I can't think of the name. No, of it's it. all good. Um, but yeah, if if you are looking for a fun game, Splendor is definitely worth it. 
Um, and it's it's a pretty easy casual game. It only goes up to four players, so if that's an issue for you. But yeah. All right. Well, I'll give you one more pick and then and then we can uh yeah. maybe we can be done. Um let's see. I was on uh I was on a boat trip recently and oh, we nice. had a, a drone. So I haven't bought a DJI drone in forever. I don't know if any of you all are into into buying drones. Like you know, they fly them around and record, right? Mm -hmm. Film stuff. I have a really old DJI mini uh, of some sort and it's great but it's loud as hell that thing is just like a monstrosity of loudness i haven't bought one in probably almost 10 years and so i recently got the dji mini 3 and it's so light and so quiet it's just unbelievable to me that and that company in general everything that they make their products are just astoundingly good the hardware is just unbelievable. So that's my pick is this, this mini, uh, what's it called? The, the mini uh, three. It's just like the battery, even the batteries are like, you're like, is there something in this battery? Like the batteries aren't even heavy. It's just wild. And it gets like 20 minutes of battery life or something, 25 minutes. It's really, it's astounding. And the picture quality that it takes is, is the best. And the kinds of footage that you can get, you take it on vacation and you can just make these, take this footage that is unbelievable. It's just so cool that like we just like, you know, you can buy this. It's like a thousand bucks, maybe mm -hmm. a little less if you don't get the, the whole kit or whatever. For like a thousand dollars, you can get this kind of aerial footage that, you know, you would have needed a helicopter before. And it's it's just so neat. I just love that, that, that that's a thing now. That's my pick. Awesome. All right. I guess we should have asked this earlier, but if people want to go check out Redwood or see what the latest and greatest is, where do they go do that? Go to redwoodjs.com. That's the website. And you can find our various communities there. We have a discourse forum. We have a Discord server. And we're on X, I guess we call it now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have that as well. You can find us there. Those are the best ways. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming and uh, spending some time with us and talking through some of these uh, ideas behind Redwood and some of the updates that are coming. Um, yeah, I've kind of, like I said, I've been fiddling with it some, this is definitely, uh, appealing to me. There are some things here that I like, so, um, yeah, maybe we'll have you back on, dig a little deeper or see where things go from here. Sounds good. Really appreciate you having me and thanks for the lively discussion. Yes, it yeah. was a great right, discussion. Folks. I really enjoyed it a lot. Learned a lot. Thank you for coming on. Awesome. You bet. Yeah. All right. Till next time, folks, Max out.